Welcome back to our last lecture on the epistemology of the 50s that brought down the logical empiricism of Carnap and the earlier versions that descended from the Vienna Circle. So what I want to do initially is do a bit of stage setting of where we are. Now, the Chisholm paper that you read was published, I believe, in 1948, and its significance was not appreciated at the time. Maybe it became appreciated by the time Chisholm published his first book, Perceiving, which was in the 50s. But Chisholm was a cryptic writer, let's put it that way. Chisholm became much more minimalist the further he went in his career. So he didn't do a lot of stage setting. He didn't do a lot of literature discussion. He didn't elaborate arguments. He just gave them and moved on. So sometimes the significance of what he was doing was not obvious to the people who were reading it. And I think the little paper, The Problem of Empiricism, is exactly like that. To my mind, it's the most significant paper of the 20th century in the mid part of the 20th century. That's unusual because it's just, it looks initially like just a discussion note of Lewis's. Um, particular version of phenomenalism. So Chisholm wrote his dissertation at Harvard under the direction of C.I. Lewis. So he knew Lewis's epistemology quite well, and he thought it was, um, it was fundamentally mistaken. So Lewis's epistemology was built on a version of phenomenalism, but Lewis also recognized that mere sensory experience wasn't going to be enough to tell the story of the nature and scope of human knowledge. You had to have something about memory in the story. And Lewis thought that there wasn't any story to be told about memory, except in terms of the prima facie credibility of any purported memory remembrance that you have. So if it seems to you that you recall getting having a certain breakfast, like bacon and eggs this morning. I don't know what you, what you had for breakfast, but if you had bacon and eggs this morning for breakfast, you might now seem to remember having had bacon and eggs. And Lewis thought the only story to tell about that is that your seeming remembrance makes it prima facie credible that you did have bacon and eggs for breakfast. Chisholm's view was that you had to generalize on that to everything. All connections between memory, perception, any other faculty that we have aimed at getting to the truth depends on prima facie credibility uh, connections. Now, the significance of that, we're going to have to do some stage setting to see what the issue is about. Okay, so uh, the background is the positivist epistemology, but it's more, it's more broad than that. So let's think of positivist epistemology of the sort Carnap was interested in as the natural extension of a view that is dominating the history of analytic philosophy, which is something like scientific naturalism. The project, if you, if you abstract away from the particular research projects that people spent their time working on. Think of Russell and Frege and Wittgenstein in the foundations of mathematics. Think of the Carnap project of trying to figure out uh, how to connect up confirmation with probability theory. Same thing with John Maynard Keynes trying to do something similar. They all had specific research programs, but the background condition for the work that they were doing was that they were naturalists or maybe physicalists, some of them might have claimed to be materialists, but it's in the domain of a version of naturalism that puts science in the highest regard when it comes to figuring out what's true and what's not. Now, the exaggerated version of that is that everything else but science is nonsense. That's an exaggerated version of that view. But the view that science has preeminent status was behind all of the efforts. And then once you get Wittgenstein's Tractatus, it turns out one way of developing that is to embrace what Wittgenstein was doing. And then you're in a position to say, the reason science is preeminent is because everything else is nonsense. 
There is this other category, of course, which involves math and logic. And what you say about that depends on who you are. As you recall, Wittgenstein said that was senseless, but it wasn't nonsense. The logical empiricists, the logical positivists say, oh, that's just analytic. So when it comes to the synthetic realm, the stuff not true in virtue of meaning alone, science is all there is. Now, on any of these exaggerated views, it turns out they got to say the philosophical project of coming up with an appropriate metaphysical understanding of the world is not a project worth undertaking. Either it's nonsense, or if you back off the exaggerated claims of the logical empiricists, that's okay. It's just unsubstantiated. There's no good epistemological story to tell if you're a scientific naturalist that could explain why what philosophers were doing or are doing when they're doing metaphysics is a respectable activity. It's just unbridled speculation. Okay, so that's the background information about the role of scientific naturalism in the history of analytic philosophy. Now, that means First and foremost, there are going to be two key worries for the view. One is about the nature of mind, because that looks like something naturalism has a hard time accommodating. The other is the nature of language, meaning, and that sort of thing. So mind and language turned out to be newly minted subdisciplines in philosophy that began in the beginning part of the 20th century. And by the time you get to the 60s and beyond, they are the most significant subdisciplines in philosophy. They probably have at least as significant a role, but probably a more significant role than traditional work in metaphysics and epistemology. Mind and language was what everybody was working on. And it was because those are the troubling areas for the dominant paradigm at the time. But now go back. You want to be able to explain the preeminence of science in your naturalistic picture of the world. So look at the notes. The background positivist epistemology arises in a context where there are persistent worries about the legitimacy of certain concepts. Some of them aren't central to science. For example, if there's metaphysical concepts that positivists thought were perhaps incoherent, they'd be perfectly happy just to give those up because they don't have much to do with science. But there are other concepts that it's harder to give up. So the concepts of morality are going to be difficult just to throw out the window, especially if you think what you're doing is supposed to have implications for how society ought to be structured and how public policy ought to be conducted. So, so put morality off to one side for a moment. But there's others that are absolutely central to science, the concept of truth and the related concept of confirmation. So science, the idea is, is supposed to be preeminent in the search for truth. So if the concept of truth turns out to be incoherent, we're going to have to do some scrambling to try to explain what science is about and what would lead us to regard it as preeminent in comparison to whatever alternatives we might find for it. So the concept of truth was viewed as troubling because there were the paradoxes of truth, in particular the liar paradox. But that problem seemed to go away by the 1930s Tarski had published his semantic conception of truth, which showed how you could have a concept of truth in a language that didn't generate paradox. So let's assume that the concept of truth got handled appropriately in a way that no longer made people, left people worrying that it was a troubled concept and wouldn't be able to be useful in characterizing the preeminence of science. The other crucial feature was the concept of confirmation because the concept of confirmation doesn't, on the face of it, look like a mathematical notion. It looks like a concept in the same neighborhood as concepts like rationality, reasonability, maybe warrant, something like that. Now, when you look at that family of concepts, you have some choices. Maybe you think those are objective concepts. Okay, let, that would be the best case if you're a logical positivist. You'd look at it and you'd say, oh, that's okay. Confirmation, the notion of confirmation that we're working with is going to be an objective notion. All right, now leave that to one side for a moment. What are the alternatives? Well, maybe confirmation is a subjective notion. Think, for example, of 
Bayesian accounts of confirmation. Bayesianism, in its, uh, in its most subjective version, says, here's how you acquire confirmation for things that you believe. You have an initial set of prior probabilities together with a big collection of conditional probabilities that tell you what to make of any future experience of learning you might have. So you believe that, say you're pretty certain, maybe completely certain, but pretty certain that today is what is today. Well, when I'm doing this, I believe this is Thursday. So I believe today is Thursday. But I also believe that I, I have a degree of confidence that in the following claim, tomorrow will be Saturday, given that today is Friday. Now, I'm pretty convinced today isn't Friday, but I still have that conditional attitude. On the assumption that today is Friday, I have a high degree of confidence that tomorrow is Saturday. All right, so you have a battery of elements that a Bayesian will exploit. It starts with your initial prior probabilities, and then it treats changes in view as a function of those initial probabilities together with your, un with your conditional attitudes, so that once you come to learn that the condition is satisfied, you have a recipe for how to update your attitudes. Namely, your new attitude should be unconditionally the same as your old attitude conditional on the piece of information that you learned. So if your old attitude, suppose, suppose you are certain that on the assumption that today is Friday, tomorrow is Saturday, then when you learn that today is Friday, you should become certain that tomorrow is Saturday, full stop, no conditionality left. All right, now there is a complete theory of confirmation that you can develop from such a subjective starting point. But notice the notion of confirmation there is relative to the subjective attitudes that you've got, and hence confirmation is a very subjective notion. That should not sit very well with anybody wanting to explain the preeminent status of science. It may be something you have to live with, but that's not where you would like to start if you're a scientific naturalist. You want, instead, something that's much more logical and objective as a theory of confirmation, which is exactly what the early Vienna Circle people and the people that took the Vienna Circle into the land of logical positivism and logical empiricism thought. So in 1921, when John Maynard Keynes published his book, he said, I'm looking for a logical and objective notion of confirmation derived from probability theory. That looks like your best hope because, of course, probability theory is a well-understood mathematical theory. So whatever you say about logic and math, you get to say the same thing about probability. And if you can understand confirmation in terms of probability, now it looks like you've got something like a logical theory of it, and it'll be as objective as probability itself. Okay, so we have first an inclination to preserve a logical and objective theory of confirmation. And second, we have an alternative, a subjective conception of confirmation, subjective approaches to confirmation that look like they should be resisted if you're a scientific naturalist. At least that's where you start from. Now in between subjective and objective is where you find morality or normativity more generally. So morality is going to be in this territory. It's not objective in the way the descriptive claims that are investigated by science are objective. But presumably, it's not completely subjective, although that was one view that people developed consistent with their logical positivist attitudes, that statements of morality are nothing more than booing and cheering for certain behaviors. Let's put it that way. So you can boo the idea of unjustified wars, or make, maybe some people cheer unjustified wars. But that's all there is to moral judgments, is this booing and cheering, which is an awfully subjective view of it. In fact, it's so subjective, it seems like it must have made a mistake because you're not taking morality seriously, and it's more serious than just what you boo and cheer for. 
So let's suppose morality is found somewhere in the middle uh, of the territory between completely subjective stuff and completely objective stuff. And it's normative because that's the way morality is. It makes claims about the world in some sense or other, but they're not descriptive claims. They're normative. They're claims about what ought to be the case or what a person ought to do or what your duty is or things like that. Now, there's a way in which confirmation can look to be a lot like morality in that sense. What is it to have information that confirms a certain point of view? You might say, well, it's to have information that tells you you ought to believe so-and-so. So evidence is obligation creating. You have a body of evidence, it confirms a certain claim. That just means you can't be rational if you don't believe that. You can't have done your intellectual duties if you don't believe that. So you can think, well, maybe confirmation is an essentially normative notion. Now that's what Chisholm is gonna defend for us, that confirmation is intrinsically normative and there's nothing you can do to get away from that position. That would be very disturbing to somebody who's a scientific naturalist because we thought you had trouble with mind and language, but it's always been the case that if you're a scientific naturalist, you're gonna to have to do something to tell us what the stuff of morality is about. But most scientific naturalists thought, oh, we'll be able to do that. That won't be that much of a problem. It just depends on how exaggerated a view you want to endorse to defend your scientific naturalism. If you're a logical positivist, you have to claim that the stuff of morality is just nonsense and then try to accommodate morality in some other way so that even though it's nonsense, it's not completely insignificant. But you can be a scientific naturalist without being a logical positivist. And if you're just a scientific naturalist, you say, well, the stuff of morality is not the stuff of science, but we're gonna be able to understand morality in terms of stuff that science is able to investigate. So the way you do that is you start talking about logical connections between the normative elements of morality and various naturalistic features of the world. So for example, if you're a utilitarian, you say, oh, don't worry about morality. What's right and wrong is just a function of the greatest happiness for the greatest number. And talk about numbers of people and happiness levels all that sort of stuff is completely descriptive. So the idea is you can embrace a version of what's called moral naturalism, and then your scientific naturalism is no longer threatened by morality. So that might work, at least it can work as long as you don't have the exaggerated views of positivist, logical positivism, but we're gonna find out it's a little bit more troubling than that. So let's start with the scientific naturalist inclination to try to keep confirmation outside of the subjective and normative realms to start with. So the idea in John Maynard Keynes and up through and in including the work of Carnap was an analogy with logicism. If mathematics is a problem, what we do is we try to understand it in terms of logic. And we do the same thing with confirmation. We want to treat confirmation as a logical and objective notion it's logical in virtue of the mathematical character of probability theory, and it's subjective because we're going to embrace a logical interpretation of probability itself. Now, we'll get to that in a moment with Carnap, but you can see this working out in the account of confirmation that I talked about in the last lecture that comes from A.J. A. Ayer. Ayer says incremental confirmation from E to H arises when and only when there are true auxiliary assumptions which do not themselves entail the evidence, but which do entail the evidence together with H. And so here's a quote from Ayer. From Ayer, the function of an empirical hypothesis is to enable us to anticipate experience. That sounds exactly right. Accordingly, if an observation to which a given proposition is relevant conforms to our expectations, that proposition is confirmed. Now, I think everybody agrees with that, but notice there's no talk of entailment here. There's no logical notion involved in that quote. What all this does is it says, confirmation is the mirror image of expectations or predictions that we generate from a theory. Ayer, though, wanted the logical entailment notion 
to be the one that was operative in understanding what it was for a, an hypothesis to generate an expectation. He didn't write that in this quote. He wrote something not quite that exaggerated. And what he wrote is something clearly true. Confirmation is the mirror image of prediction or expectation. Whether, it's, uh, whether the notion of expectation here should be understood in terms of entailment is what's at, at issue. So then he writes, it's the mark of a genuine factual proposition that some experiential propositions can be deduced from it in conjunction with certain premises without being deducible from those other premises alone. So notice that's where the language of entailment first comes in. You can't be a genuine factual proposition if we can't deduce experiential propositions from you, at least together with certain other assumptions. Okay, so you put the two together and we get the idea that the way in which an empirical hy hypothesis enables us to anticipate experience is by entailing it in conjunction with certain other premises. Now, as you saw, it, as we saw in our discussion, I guess it was when I was talking about Quine, when, we, when I talked about error in that like, uh, this is an easy view to make fun of, and it's far from obvious that the right way to understand anticipations of experience is in terms of entailments from the hypothesis. Chisholm is going to try to convince us that it's not only hard to understand, it's just flat out false. Empirical hypotheses do not ever entail anything about experience, even in conjunction with the other premises. Uh, except in the trivial case where you make the certain other premises, things like the hypothesis, if the hypothesis is true, then the experience um, obtains. But that's to trivialize the entailment requirement. Okay, so then um, what happened after air? People uh, tended to make fun of Ayer's theory of confirmation. So Carl Hempel thought, we have to start over. And he too is on the trail of finding a logical account of confirmation. So what you look for are logical conditions that confirmation obeys. He thought he had found some. One was the entailment condition, so that if E entails or implies age, then E confirms H. Another one was the special consequence condition. If E confirms H and H, I think that's supposed to be H is logically equivalent to H prime. So H implies H prime and vice versa, not just one direction. So if H is logically equivalent to H prime, then that evidence confirms H prime as well. And he also endorsed the special consistency condition. If E confirms H and H is logically incompatible with H prime, then E doesn't confirm H prime. Notice the connection with logic in every case. There's always the language of confirmation and the language of logic being linked in one way or another by each of these principles. The reason is because we're looking for a connection between confirmation and logic. We can't get the logicality of confirmation if we don't link confirmation and logic. And look at the converse consequence condition. If E confirms H and H is implied by H prime, then E also confirms H prime. All right, you put, put converse together with special consequence and you get the logical equivalence claim that I was talking about a moment ago. Now, what's of interest here is not whether these conditions correctly describe the nature of confirmation, but the nature of the project that Hempel is engaged in he immediately turns to logical notions when attempting to begin his theory of confirmation. The problem is his uh, beginning point with these connections between logic and confirmation generated a paradox. It's called the Raven paradox. Uh, the Raven paradox is this. Uh, presumably seeing an instance confirms a generalization. So take the generalization, all ravens are black. If you see a black raven, that will confirm to a tiny, small, positive amount that the generalization is correct. It, of course, won't give you good enough reason to think it's true, but it'll give you a little bit more than you had uh, before you saw the black raven. Why? 
Well, maybe because the generalization implies each of the instances. And so each instance counts a little bit toward the truth of the generalization. Um, now, it's not really true that the generalization implies the instances because the sentence all ravens are black doesn't imply that there are any ravens. So maybe you need to add in there are some ravens and then the generalization together with the claim that there are some ravens will entail that those ravens are black. Okay, suppose you go like that. At least now you've got some connection between the generalization and the instances. And when we add each of these incremental bits of confirmation together by having observed each and every raven, we get conclusive confirmation of the generalization since there's nothing more to it than the truth of each of the instances. So notice that the confirmation by instances claim would survive abandoning the last point, the nothing more to truth claim. If the generalization entails the instances, we would still be attracted to the idea that more experience of the, in, of the instances gives more credibility to the generalization on grounds that the generalization predicts the instances. Presumably, in this case, by entailing it, although um, in fact the entailment claim is false, the generalization doesn't entail the instances. In slogan form, confirmation is the mirror image of prediction. The question is whether prediction should be identified with entailment. And at least prediction in terms of entailment allows one to hang on to the analogy with logicism. Logical positivism pinned its hopes that confirmation isn't suspect because it's a concept that can be explained in logical terms. Prediction is entailment and confirmation is the mirror image of prediction. And notice that account fits quite well with phenomenalism. Think back to the second dogma that Quine talked about. Any, the truth of any statement has to bottom out in terms of statements about sensory experience and vice versa. That's phenomenalism. All right, now this is where Chisholm comes into the story because Chisholm's gonna say this idea that prediction is to be understood in terms of entailment is simply unsustainable. His claim is material object statements don't predict understood as entailment any sensory experience of any sort. Prediction is going to have to be an epistemic notion rather than a logical one. Now, if it's an epistemic notion, it might still be objective in some sense or other, but it's also gonna be normative. So it's gonna have the same kinds of status that moral judgments in general do. And now logical positivists are gonna get a little squeamish about the whole thing, because that means all of science and the, kinds of the kind of preeminent status that scientific explanation and inquiry has will be of just the same sort as the kind of normative status we find when talking about morality. So if you are a logical positivist and you want science to be really re well respected and you wanna be happy about science, um, but you have a different attitude toward morality that it is more questionable, maybe falls on the nonsense side of things, you will be in a very awkward position if Chisholm is right because he's telling us science, the notion of confirmation central to science and normativity more generally have to be on the same side of the fence. All right, so that's the significance of Chisholm's attack here. Now, what's the strategy? The strategy is to use monotonicity. Now, what does monotonicity involve? Monotonic logics are ones where once you get the signal turned on between X and Y, so that X entails Y or Y is deducible from X, no amount of further learning or adding more premises can ever undermine that connection. So that's monotone. Just think about singers who are monotone. It never changes. Once the note starts, if they're gonna be singing, it's gonna be singing the same note all the time. So if X entails Y, then you can add anything you want to X and it will still entail why. Now, the first thing that you should wonder, if this sounds like maybe it's not true, you might be thinking, well, what if you add not X to X? Doesn't that undermine the entailment? The answer is no, because from a contradiction, 
you can derive anything in two steps. I'm not sure that I have shown how to do this, so I'll do that right over here on the side. So suppose you have x and you add to it not x. Now tell me what you want to derive from um, this combination of premises. Anything at all that you want to derive. I don't care what it is. Let's just call it phi. Well, here's a good logical principle. This is called addition or wedge introduction. This is this wedge is our symbol for or. So you go like this. Well, if x is true, then so is x or phi. Because x or phi is strictly weaker than x. If it's raining outside, if I know that it's raining outside, then I can deduce from that that either it's raining outside or the moon is shining. Now, of course, it's daytime, so the moon isn't shining, but big deal. The or sentence will still come out true. And then notice what I've got with these two premises. I've got x, one of these two is true, x or phi, and it's not the first. So it's the second. That conclusion follows from these two premises. So once I get a contradiction, I can prove anything I want in two steps, including the original y that I started with. So if x entailed y, even if I add not x to x, I can still derive y in two steps. It probably makes the proof easier to get a contradiction. Uh, so the way that's talked about in information theory is once you get a contradiction, you get an information explosion, because absolutely everything follows from a contradiction very fast. Okay, so entailment is monotonic. That's the first point to note. So that gives us a strategy. Suppose somebody says, well, y is entailed by x. You can show that that's not true by coming up with some other claim, z, where on the assumption that x and z are true, it doesn't follow that y. In Chisholm's case, he's going to try to come up with a z so that what follows, or what's to be expected in the story, is the opposite of y, which shows that the experience that you predicted from the hypothesis is not an experience that can be deduced from the hypothesis or deduced from the hypothesis in conjunction with other things. Okay, so that's the strategy. He's looking for a value for x so that x plus z entails that y is false. Um, and he says that that will show that x doesn't entail y. That's almost right. Um, you, have to, you have to be committed to the claim that x and z is possible um, because if x and z is itself contradictory, then uh, the fact that not y files, follows from x and z doesn't show that y doesn't also follow from x and z. After all, everything follows from a contradiction. So let's say x plus z is not contradictory. It's really a possibility. Okay, now what's interesting, I don't know how many of you are aware of Plantinga's work on the problem of evil. This is precisely what Plantinga did in 19, well, 68 to 75, when he was writing on the problem of evil and was examining what he called the logical problem of evil, which takes as a premise evil exists and claims to be able to show that it follows from this that God doesn't exist. What he did was he said, look, compatible with E is another claim, and you can go look and see what his other claim was, but here's a claim that's compatible with E, and if you put it together with E, you can derive the existence of God. So given that fact, 
if that is a fact and R is compatible with E, then the non-existence of God simply can't follow from the existence of evil. It's on the basis of his discussion of this logical problem of evil that the discussion about the problem of evil changed from the logical problem to the evidential problem. So the idea was, okay, there is no logical incompatibility between the existence of God and the existence of evil. But that, of course, doesn't show that the existence of evil isn't evidence against the existence of God. The accomplishment of Flanagan's project was to undermine the logical problem of evil and force the discussion into epistemology rather than in the realm of logic itself. Okay, so that's interesting. And what's interesting as well is that Flanagan doesn't show any awareness that this strategy is really a Chisholmian strategy, first developed in 1948, about 20 years before uh, Flanagan published God and Other Minds, and then short excerpts of that in other books. I think the second book was God, Freedom, and Evil, which is discussion of the problem of evil, basically lifted from God and Other Minds. In any case, this is a really impeccable strategy for undermining the claim that one thing follows logically from another. Just find something compatible with the premise so that it's clear that the denial of the conclusion should be affirmed in addition to those two bits of information. And then you will have shown that the information you started with does not entail what was being claimed. So Chisholm applies this strategy to C.I. Lewis's phenomenalism. So we're now in the domain of Quine's second dogma, which is, let me write again here. You take a material object statement, maybe it's a statement about something that looks to be observable, like there's a tree outside my window, or maybe it's fancy material object statements of high level particle physics, like atoms have that, that are inert have equal numbers of protons and electrons in them. Okay, maybe something like that. It doesn't matter whether it's a claim about unobservables or a claim that we would ordinarily count as one about observables. It's just not a report of a sense data statement or a sensory experience. So phenomenalism says there are logical connections running both ways between sense data statements. This will be fun. We'll call those SDSs. You can tell that I was young in the 60s. SDS is an acronym that has a special meaning to people who were alive in the 60s. Maybe, you, maybe you're aware of this, Students for a Democratic Society. No, I wasn't a member of uh, Students for a Democratic Society. There's an entailment. There needs to be an entailment for phenomenalism to work. The material object statement has to entail something in the domain of sense data. And when you put all of the stuff together, suppose you have a whole big collection of sense data statements of the right form, one through n, the whole group together should take you back to something that implies the material object statement. And then confirmation between, let's call this one x and this one y, confirmation from y to x obtains because confirmation is the mirror of entailment. Very cool view. All right, now confirmation can be the mirror of entailment even if phenomenalism is false because um, maybe phenomenalism is false because you can't get a collection of sense data statements that's big enough or extensive enough to entail the material object statement. But really, for the mirror image claim to be true, all you need is the entailment from MOS to SDS. Okay, and that's what C.I. Lewis wanted to defend. That's central to his phenomenalist project. Now, he had a particular version of it, which had to do with uh, conditional statements that um, had seeming actions in their antecedent and seeming experiences in their consequent. So the door is closed, maybe we're supposed to imply, if it seems to me that the door is in front of me and I seem to try to walk through the space it occupies, uh, 
it will seem to me that there's a hard surface pre preventing me from doing so. So maybe that's it. it. It doesn't matter what the details are, but you can see what's going on. The antecedent will involve at least a seeming action of a certain sort. Now, what's crucial is you have to have the sensory qualifiers here. You can't just put in the antecedent. If the door is in front of me and I try to walk through it, I won't succeed. That would not be any kind of phenomenalistic reduction of material object statements to sense data statements. So you take the material object statement, the door is closed, and then you have to clarify it in terms of uh, entailing certain seeming statements. So that's the crucial issue that Chisholm is going to go after. And then what he says is that's not going to work because take the material object statement, the door is closed, and add something from the uh, playbook of skepticism. Add in some stuff about hallucination or illusion or you're on LSD or something along those lines, right? So the door is closed and I'm hallucinating because I just took LSD. And so now look at the claim. If it seems to you that the door is in front of you and you seem to try to walk through the space it occupy, occupies, it will seem to you that you're floating, maybe, or flying, or the world is turning yellow. I mean, I don't know what to predict for the course of your seeming states if you're hallucinating while on LSD, but it's pretty easy to see that you could easily have it seem that the door in question is in front of you and that you seem to be trying to walk through the space it occupies and also that it seems to you that you just did, even though you knocked yourself in the face and fell flat on your back. There's nothing about the course of seeming experience that stays predictable once you're hallucinating or suffering an illusion. You could also, by the way, if you don't want to talk about these, you could talk about cases where unbeknownst to you, your spinal cord was severed. And so you seem to reach out for the door. Think about how phantom pains work in people who've lost limbs in war. Uh, they still have phantom pains in their leg, even though your leg isn't there. So you could have experiences like that where you don't even have arms that are working or maybe they've been removed. And it seems to you that your arm is reaching out and it seems to you that you're trying to turn the doorknob but it's not seeming to you that the door is opening. So um, whatever is the truth about the door being closed and being able to be opened by turning the knob and all that sort of stuff doesn't imply anything about the course, the sequence of seeming experiences you're going to have when undertaking certain seeming actions. That's the heart of Chisholm's strategy for undermining the entailment claim between, whoops, between material object statements and sense data statements. So Chisholm is not saying that the door being closed should lead you to predict that you aren't going to be able to walk through it without doing something to get it open. So the door is closed might predict that if I'm standing in front of the door and try to walk through it, I won't succeed. That's a reasonable prediction from the hypothesis in question that the door is closed. But notice phenomenalism makes a much, much stronger claim than that. It claims that certain seeming experiences are entailed by the truth of the material object statement. Lewis responded to this criticism in a way that I can't make any sense out of. I think, I think he was being defensive. I've read it several times. I don't know what he's doing. So let's just assume yeah, Chisholm's right. All of epistemology, according to Chisholm, rests fundamentally on credibility connections alone. So confirmation is the mirror image of prediction, but that doesn't remove it from the normative realm. It's just, you've got these connections. The hypothesis predicts something. So if you're going to endorse anything, it should be 
what's predicted by the material object statement. And then by endorsing those predictions, you're able to test the hypothesis in question. You go see if experience fits what the hypothesis predicted. That's how scientific testing goes. And it's also how common sense testing works in general. There's nothing special about science in this respect. Confirmation is the mirror image of prediction. And Chisholm's point is neither one, neither confirmation nor prediction is a logical notion. You cannot explain either one in terms of the notion of entailment. It's instead gonna be either a subjective notion or a nor normative notion. Chisholm's preference was to not go completely subjective. Uh, I think many people will side with Chisholm about that. We want the notion of confirmation not to be relative to the person who is doing the evaluation, but rather relative to the quality of information that the person has. And then Chisholm says, all you can say is that body of information makes it be an intellectual duty of yours to believe what it supports if you're going to form a belief at all. And that's the way Chisholm starts his epistemology. He says, we're going to start with the basic relation of one thing being more reasonable to believe than another. And then when he talks about this notion, this relation of reasonability, he says, well, as an intellectual being, you have a duty to try your best to get to the truth and avoid error. So when one thing is more reasonable to believe than another, given a particular body of information, you have an intellectual duty to believe the second, if you're gonna believe anything at all, to believe the claim that's better supported if you're gonna believe anything at all. And notice what that does is it generalizes on Lewis's attitude toward memory. Lewis did not think material object statements entailed anything about what you'll seem to remember or won't seem to remember. And that seems obviously right. Even if material object statements entailed something about the course of experience, it certainly doesn't, they certainly don't entail anything about the quality of your memory and whether it'll work right or whether it won't, right, won't work right. So Lewis said, we have to have an account of memory in our story of our knowledge of the world and all we can say is seeming memories make reasonable believing what their memory is a memory of. And that's all you can say about it. So that would be equally a normative conception of credibility or confirmation in Lewis's theory as well. He just thought he could get the phenomenalist stuff and Chisholm argues convincingly that you can't you can't get entailment in the story at all. So here's a quote from Chisholm. The translatability thesis, that is the phenomenalistic claim that Lewis was defending. However, it doesn't claim to provide an account of the respect in which our knowledge of things is founded in and is verifiable and falsifiable in sense experience. If we deny this thesis, we must provide an alternative account of the manner in which such experience may be said to justify our knowledge of things. So Chisholm says, it's not enough just to dump on uh, the phenomenalists. We have to say something else. It is, and here's what he says. It is relevant to note that in principle, the problem becomes similar to that of the validity of memory and that Professor Lewis's own method of treating the latter problem may in fact be applicable to both problems. The possibility of our having any knowledge at all, he believes, required, requires that we make two assumptions about memory. Quote, first, whatever is remembered, whether as explicit recollection or merely in the form of our sense of the past, is prima facie credible because so remembered. And second, when the whole range of empirical beliefs is taken into account, all of them more or less dependent upon memorial knowledge, we find that those which are the most credible can be assured by their mutual support or congruence. So notice there's two aspects. The first aspect is the normativity involved in his story about memory. And the second point is the role of congruence or coherence in the story of what we know and what we don't know. Uh, Chisholm took up both of those points. If, if thing statements are not translatable into sense datum statements, it may be that the validity of our perceptual knowledge of things requires similar assumptions. It may be that 
whenever the presence of a sense datum leads one to it, accept a belief about a material thing, e.g. whenever, as a matter of fact, the presence of a red sense datum leads one to accept the belief that one is observing a red thing, the belief which is thus perceptually accepted is prima facie credible because it is so accepted. Well, not just because it's accepted, but because it's accepted on the basis of the perception in question. Indeed, Mr. Price, this is H.H. H. Price, has said as much. And it may be that when the whole range of our perceptual beliefs are taken into account, all of them more or less dependent upon our perceptual acceptances, we find that those which are most credible can be assured by their mutual support. These assumptions do not claim any faculties for man, for humanity, which are not involved in Professor Lewis's defense of memory. Whether they will suffice for justifying perceptual knowledge, however, is a question which can be answered only on the basis of a discussion as thorough as the one which Professor Lewis devotes to memory. All right, that's the final judgment of Chisholm in this 1948 paper. It sets out a project of trying to show that you can do what Lewis, is, what Lewis did about memory for all of perception, and the result is a normative understanding of the notions of justification, confirmation, rationality, reasonability, warrant all the central notions that take us from true belief in the direction of knowledge. Because if you're gonna to get to knowledge, there have to be some standards that your belief has met other than truth. So whatever those standards are, let's call that the epistemic dimension needed to get you from true belief to knowledge. And Chisholm's view is that epistemic dimension is not a logical and objective notion. It is rather a normative notion. Now, Chisholm, I believe, thought it was both normative and objective. And of course, no logical empiricist, logical positivist could agree to that because only the descriptive is the realm where objectivity is found. But this is part of the death knell for logical empiricism. You simply have to give up on the project. So the implication of this approach is that epistemology is irreducibly normative. The positive prog positivist program is undermined because it can't any longer rely on an epistemology to secure the objectivity of the connection between evidence and theory if we understand objectivity in terms of something within the realm of what science investigates, namely the descriptive realm rather than the normative. If you've already dumped on ethical statements as having no cognitive content or not really being intellectually respectable, and if your epistemology gets classified in the same way, it's a lot worse for you than simply having to abandon your reductive inclinations where you want to turn everything into the language of sense data statements. So the positivist program rested on a reduction, a reductionism and a foundationalism to sense data of some sort with scientific objectivity resting on objective and logical confirmation relations arising out of the reductionism, especially out of the direction of implication in which claims about the world are supposed to be entailing claims about our experience. Quine and Sellers take us away from reductionism and foundationalism toward coherentism, moving toward a holism involving no foundational role for experience and no atomistic confirmation connections between experience and claims about the world. Chisholm, on the other hand, attacks the aspect of reductionism left untouched by the Quine-Sellers critique. That from material object statements to sensation claims. Neither Klein nor Sellers tried to undermine that direction of implication. And so Chisholm's attack is new and different. And then he draws the conclusion that any adequate epistemology will have to be irreducibly normative. I guess it could also be subjective, but let's be as kind as we can to the scientific naturalist inclination. So we don't want to make it just subjective. That would uh, completely undermine the preeminent status that science is supposed to have. So let's say it'll have to be irreducibly normative, and thus that the objectivity of science can't be grounded in logical and objective confirmation relations. 
because that would require entailed predictions and there just aren't any. So what gets threatened by all of this is not just redu reductionism, not just the notion of analyticity that Klein was after, not even just the myth of the given that Sellers was after. All three of those Klein and Sellers critiques could be used to undermine, but objectivity itself is at stake. What is it for science to be objective? And what is it for the objectivity of science to fit nicely with a naturalistic conception of the world and everything about it? That's now up for grabs because if objectivity can be preserved after Chisholm, it's gonna to have to be preserved in a way that leaves room for normativity. So the project that the Vienna Circle took from reading the Tractatus has to be abandoned. The Tractatus, remember, said, what can be said can be said clearly in the language of logic and science. And the stuff that's really important, namely the stuff in the normative realm can't be said at all, but can only be shown. Well, science is gonna end up in the same domain in the Tractatus if Chisholm is right. Science itself, in order to be objective, will have to be partially normative. Okay. So if, let's stop with this one. If the 20th century began from the hope of making the world safe from muddled metaphysics and safe for satisfying science, by the middle of the 20th century, we end up with science being in the same boat as ethics and we have no rationally compelling narrative as to why scientific approaches are intellectually better than unscientific approaches. We still would be waiting on an account of why scientific investigation is objective in a way that these others are not. <laughs>